nice of you guys to come this early. I know, right? Oh my gosh. You have it amazing. Is this, oh, it is working. That's amazing. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out at 9 a.m. We didn't, as you <laughs> noticed. I have permission from him to A, speak for him, and B, mock him for his hungoverness. His text, ma'am. He's a good friend, so I'll answer all questions for quick. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here on the last day of this PPF. Um, I have no German agenda whatsoever. Um, <laughs> my friend Kimberly just returned this book to me. So please read nothing into the prep. Um, so uh, we've got a little bit of time to um, talk to some of the playwrights of this year's PPF. Um, I thought we'd start by just sort of saying hi, introducing ourselves, and the play with which we are associated, and then we'll go from there into more detailed information. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Aditi Kapil. I'm uh, a playwright living here in LA at the moment. I've had the pleasure of being part of PPF and part of SCR for a couple of years now. Um, actually, this theater uh, housed my play Orange um, a couple of years ago, which was just oh, lovely. So I have warm feelings about this space. Thank you. Um, so why don't we go from this side that away? And hey, I might switch it up for other questions and prepare yourselves. It's going to be a good morning. Um, and just uh, your name and the play with which you're associated, and if you can count it out efficiently in your head, maybe how many PPFs you got under your belt, might be kind of fun to know. That'll be easy. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sean Hartley. I, I'm the lyricist for Prelude to a Kiss, and this is my first PPS. Yay! <laughs> Woo! Welcome. Hi, I'm Craig Lucas. I'm the uh, book writer of Prelude, and this is the, my second PPF. I was here in 2004 with a play called The Singing Forest that South Coast didn't produce. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a very honest panel. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I'm Adam Bach. Uh, I was a playwright of the Canadians. Uh, I got a commission about nine years ago, and I finally did it. And this th was this <laughs> my first time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin Arteague. I uh, wrote a play called Sheepdog. I was here last year uh, with a play called Sheepdog. <laughs> 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 And we'll be joined uh, in, uh, in a... Oh, yay! yay. <laughs> I'm wide awake. Okay. <laughs> you did so much better than Quee. Oh, okay. Um, it's going to be all, all, the last of the That's hour. Hot. It's hot. So it's we're hot. just doing name, play with which you're associated, and if you can figure it out quickly, just how many PPFs you've had under your belt. Oh, uh, I can. It's, a, it's small. Uh, my name's Anna Nogueda. I wrote um, Mask Only, and this is my second PPF. Yay! Woo! Awesome. Thank you for being here. Of I'm course. Aditi. Anna, nice to meet Hi, you. Hi, Aditi. Um, <laughs> Um, so one of my favorite things about PPF and just like big playwright gatherings like this, aside from getting to see my friends, is that I also kind of get to, I get this, this great expanse of like work that I get to see very quickly, but also I get to dip into what people are thinking about these days, like what artists are thinking about and making work about these days. Um, and I get like the inside stories sometimes, I get the, oh, this moment happened and then this play happened and this is why this happened in this moment and this is why this got transformed into this style of play in this moment. Um, and so I'm wondering if you guys would be up for talking about the moments that kind of generated these plays for you, um, whether it be personal, whether it be the world right now, whether it be a revisiting of a work that needed to be transformed in a particular way right now. Um, we can go in any order you like if someone's feeling that one and wants to jump in. <laughs> or I can just hit Anna. Oh, cool. That's how that cool. goes. <laughs> you're a tagger. Show up late. This is what you yeah. get. Um, uh, yeah, I think these guys have actually heard some of some of this. Um, my play mask only, I think, was uh, sort of living in me subconsciously and unconsciously for for a very long time. I grew up doing musical theater, and I, I went to college to study musical theater exclusively. Uh, and I, it kind of gets you into this underground world of, of fans and, and 
quite passionate people. It's like closer to like hanging out with gamers than it is to hanging out with like fancy actors. Um, just people that are like so adept at knowing all the ins and outs of, of this uh, like quite niche art form that like generates a lot of revenue, but then has this whole other sort of like uh, um, world of, of high art. Um, and so that is a world I felt very comfortable kind of like riffing in, which is a gift as a playwright. I'm not really smart enough to write a play about something I had to research. Um, <laughs> I, I do much better if it's like in me and I just know how people how people speak. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And then um, within that, I uh, in college, um, sorry for people who've heard this story before, but I they they did a drag show every year. It was student run. Um, and it was like it was truly extraordinary and it was better than any of the main stages that the actual school had produced. Uh, it, it really, it, it was, it's like embarrassing for the program that the drag show was so good. Uh, and, um, and it would like be passed from, from guy to guy, so like a senior would graduate and then like anoint a sophomore, be like, you're in charge of this next year. And, um, and one year, I, was this, I wasn't in the class where this happened, but um, senior year you have showcase you plan for showcase when you come out to New York and you perform your, your one song for all the agents and casting directors and you, it's high stress. And um, the seniors have a showcase class where they're kind of honing their material and trying to find out how they can best essentially sell themselves as a performer to New York City. And the drag show happened and it was amazing. And um, what, the next day in showcase class, a girl had gotten up to perform and um, she did her song, and the teacher said to her, you should talk to your friend. All names have been changed to protect the innocent, but like Jason, uh, and have him, I saw him perform at the drag show last night, and you should have him teach you how to perform like a real woman. <laughs> and she was like, Ugh, like record scratch. The teacher didn't even realize what was wrong with that comment. Um, but then simultaneously, like Jason and all the gay men in our class, of which there are many, are being told they're, they have to butch it up in like some weird, like kind of trying not to be offensive way. And it's like nobody fits. No one's fitting in. And, and then at the same time, like they are the community of this art form. So why is that this art form really leaving them out and I so I, I wanted to explore that and and these questions of masculinity and femininity and and those boxes and 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 we talk about we're talking about that a lot now um, but I, I wanted to talk about it in the in the the casing of these like weird outcasts so that's that sorry that was quite long Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love these stories it's so good um, so I do like to research my plays a lot. <laughs> He's smarter than I am. No, <laughs> I just I just am slow uh, and afraid of myself. So, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so I'll spend many years avoiding writing about me and finding where I am in the play and researching, you know, subject matter, the world. That's usually where I start. Some kind of ethical question that really is, you know, sticking with me um, I, that I can't shake. So I would say Sheepdog started with. Um, kind of blueprints for a couple characters. And the first is, um, there's an officer named Nakia Jones. And this was on the heels of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, two um, fairly infamous police shootings. The, the, the videos went viral. That was followed by um, uh, a shooting in Dallas of some officers. So it was a really traumatic week. Um, and she was an active duty police officer in Cleveland. And she went on Facebook and she, um, posted a Facebook Live video, which was essentially um, a rant and a plea, a very sort of emotional plea um, from an officer, active duty officer, um, a black woman, um, saying just this all has to stop. This, this just needs to stop right now. You're making it, 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 it impossible for me to do my job. And, if, and, and she repeated this over and over. And this, this just really came from her subconscious. She was saying, if you're white and you're racist and you, and, and you are policing neighborhoods with people of color, stop, take that uniform off, just take it off. 
Um, fast forward, she, um, Obama invited her to the White House. Um, she got fired from her job. She's still fired. Um, so, so and, and I sort of think both those things happening speak to our world, that she couldn't keep her job, and the police department shoved her out, but yet she was embraced in one respect. So that's what, that was one character, just as a writer, filed that away. Another was um, this amazing, incredible um, a piece of journalism, which was uh, an interview with the officer Darren Wilson, who shot uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson. It's rare to get access to these officers post-shootings. Uh, a journalist went to his house while he was in hiding and interviewed him. And what struck me as a playwright was his lack of words for what he had done and how rare it is to have these officers forced to, in words, describe their actions mm -hmm. and account for their actions. And they often can't. In the case of Darren Wilson, he's an inarticulate um, working class man. Mm -hmm. um, and every word told a story about his background and who he was and where it came from. Um, so those characters filed away, many misstarts, many drafts thrown away, had to find my way into this story and figure out what on earth I, I had to say about police violence that, would, that needs to be heard or that I felt um, needed to be heard. It took a long time. Um, and I arrived here. Mm -hmm. and we're, we're, we're really lucky to be playwrights. I was, I was just thinking, because what you guys just said was so interesting, and we get to sit and really try and figure out things, and it's really cool. I, lo I love my job. I feel really fortunate. Um, I think mine started, I, I think I had the title, The Canadians, and it made me laugh. I was just like, because <laughs> <laughs> in America, people, the Canadians are stupid, or funny, or you know, different, or whatever. Uh, it came from remembering when I first, as a gay guy, went to Provincetown from Rhode Island. And I went to Provincetown and I couldn't breathe because the whole, the streets were full of gay guys. And, uh, and then I went on a gay cruise another time and I remembered that feeling, but it was qu quite a bit later. I lived in San Francisco and I'd gotten used to the feeling of like being maybe that we could be in the majority ever. And it made me really think about how I don't think uh, straight people know what happens to a gay kid when you're born into a family, there's no one else like you, and you have a secret for the first maybe 14, maybe the first 20, maybe even the first 30 years of your life that you can't, you feel you're unable to share, and what that does to people, and that we don't get credit for surviving. You know, when my father said that to me, because he, he said that to me, that's the thing I said, where that must have been hard on you, uh, not having one to help you. It was the perfect response, because I was like, it was. It was really hard. And uh, I think it's uh, shameful and unfair that uh, gay people are considered uh, odd because we have gone through a huge trauma. And uh, uh, it's just not fair. And to then be told you're bad when you do come out, you know, imagine that. You're alone. You're a little kid. You're alone. I knew I was gay when, probably when I was like about five, put it aside and really knew when I was 13, and then didn't come out until I was 23 or 24. This was back. I'm so excited for the kids that are coming out, you know, at seven, at 14, because they don't, they don't go through the years of uh, watching and hearing people say, I remember my dad would come home and he'd say, oh, you know, he had to stand up to his hockey team and say, stop saying fag. I have a kid who's gay, you know, but that's just what I grew up with. And it's just awful to constantly be told you're no good. So I want to write about that and I want to write about how uh, gay people, I've had a lot of people older than me who have uh, helped me. Mm. So that's where that came from. I can hardly remember who the person was who wrote this play, <laughs> Prelude to a Kiss. Yeah. Um, but I do remember that um, South Coast, because of Jerry Patch and David Ems and, and Marty Benson and uh, John Glor produced a play of mine that no one reviewed in New York City. Mm. 
And I thought the play was just dead, and they did a production of my play, Reckless, and uh, that was its second production. And when I came out to see it, it was very well directed and, and a beautiful production. They said, would you like to write another play for us? And I was astonished. I didn't even know there were commissions, because I was a musical theater person. <laughs> I started in the chorus of Broadway musicals um, and didn't really start writing plays until I was in my 30s. So they gave me the most enormous gift, and I didn't know what I, what I was doing. And that's the only thing that has remained constant through my life, is that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> And um, some of the things that everyone has talked about so far, about what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine, um, are still seeming to me to be at the center of um, our awareness. It's very exciting to see playwrights of, from different parts of the American landscape representing their experience here. And I'm really mm -hmm. excited about that. I went to see. Um, poor yellow rednecks the other night and more than half the audience was Asian and I just started weeping. I was so happy. Um, but the theater is a far cry from Washington. And my play was written in the middle of the AIDS epidemic and it is about what it means to suddenly become old and face mortality, which was what was happening to me when I wrote the play. And now, this week, the Supreme Court is trying to decide whether or not gay people lesbians, transgendered people, bisexuals, even have the right to be protected from discrimination. It is 60 years this summer since Stonewall. And the central character in Prelude to a Kiss was a socialist back in 1987 when I wrote the play, and she is still a socialist. Back then, it was thought to be cute. Now it is the subject for demonization. The new fascists, better known as the Republican Party, are trying to drive people off the edge of the cliff to protect their privilege. And so I'm more scared now. And what changed, and the reason I wanted to come back and do the musical, is that this kooky character who thought the world was about to blow up is now seen to be the Cassandra who predicted what is true which is we're about to blow up the world if we're not very, very careful and if we don't take these men with their bullying away from the control panel. Mm. Mm. That's right. <laughs> so when you write musicals, <laughs> you basically spend your whole life looking for what would make a good musical. Every book I read, ev everything I see, every story I read, I think, would that make a good musical? Um, and it just happened that a friend of mine was playing piano in, for a, the American in Paris, and he told me that the book writer was Craig Lucas, and he was mm. becoming friendly with Craig Lucas, and I immediately said, ah, talk to him, see if we can write a musical about Prelude to a Kiss, I, which is a play I remembered from my first days in New York. I love that play. Mm -hmm. So I, I just immediately jumped for it. And he set up a, an interview, and Craig said, sure, try it. Then I had to figure out, all right, so now why? Why do I want to do this? I love the play, but how is it relevant now? And what I realized um, when I was young, what, what appealed to me was this idea of a young person who's suddenly old. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so young anymore, <laughs> so I kind of saw it from uh, a different perspective. And I felt like, well, what, we're going to set it now. What's going on now? And uh, Craig just talked very eloquently about what's going on now. But in my mind, I just felt like everyone I know is very anxious and very nervous, wh wh whichever side you're on, you've, be, you've been made to become part of one side and there's an enemy in a way that I don't remember uh, for, for many years. And I thought, well, what is the mitigating circumstance of that? And it's, well, it, I have a, a partner who I've been with for many years, it's love. And I thought, this is so mm -hmm. odd that in the most stressful times in, you know, in Iran, in North Korea, in Nazi Germany, throughout time, People are still falling in love, <laughs> having families, and, uh, and how interesting that is to have love in, a, in an anxious time. 
So uh, those of you who saw the reading, the, so the, the song that pulled it all together is Love in the Age of Anxiety, and, and it, love does go on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Guys. Um, this is this is such a lovely Sam, and I didn't know about any of like these answers. I'm just hearing them for the first time now. It was not a repeat for me, um, but it's such an amazing representation. I think across the board of how deeply uh, artists, playwrights in particular, here think about what they're putting into the world and mm. the responsibility of what we're putting into the world and what a moment requires from us and the dialogue the theater is live, always trying to have with the world. Um, so I thought it would be interesting in this moment in American theater to kind of flip it a little bit and talk about the, I mean, the theaters, the institutions that are the curators of how this art then makes it out into the world. And we've had this huge sea change in the past couple of years in American theater where there's been a lot of changes in leadership, including here at South Coast, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, there's a lot of new leaders of theaters in the American theater that are doing a lot of dreaming and visioning right now. And there's a lot of boards across the country that have thought hard about what they want their theater to be and thus chosen a particular leader. Um, and I would love to um, take our <coughs> thinkers, our artist thinkers here, and take a moment and see if we can like dream and vision a little bit also and kind of put it into the world as to what we think American theater might be wanting to head towards what we think is necessary in our moment, in our future, as artists, the pathways we'd like to see. Really anything, I'm leaving it as open as possible because I feel like, I mean, we got this fabulous crowd here and then we've got, mm -hmm. I don't know, high hell round somewhere, um, just take an opportunity to speak into the world something you'd like to see for American theater as the thinkers that you are within it. And again, it can start from any end you I'll like. I'll start. Yeah, great. Um, uh, when I go see one of my plays, I, I told the, I went to a dinner and uh, I said I'd like to meet the board um, because I like to know who is helping pay for this. <laughs> Uh, because I think it's, I, I guess what I would like to see is a closer connection between the audience and us. Like actually to know that I, I don't like plays that tell you what to do. Like I don't want to write a play that says to you, you should be doing this. What I want to write is something that then you would go off and say, huh, I wonder whether he's right, that would be a good idea or not, you know what I mean? And it feels to me like there's been a bit of a um, capitalization of theater where we make a product that then you say good or bad rather than it's a dialogue between the two. And I think something that's changing now is actually there are, uh, the great thing about bringing more new voices and new people in all aspects in the staff and the actors and the playwrights and the direct is suddenly we realize oh there's a chance to actually talk to the with rather than at so that's what i would hope that we recognize that that's why we're doing it is we're trying to talk to i mean in a in a weird way i started very small theaters and, and i had community my community in rhode island the very first uh I quit because I didn't like theater. And then I started again because a couple of friends of mine wanted to do a drag show for a coming out day. And so I wrote them a little skit called uh, Act Up. Uh, uh, the House of Chanel goes to Act Up. So it was three models, the three boys dressed as Chanel models who decided to join Act Up. And it was a huge hit. So then I did uh, Gay Boy Nutcracker. This is in Rhode Island. And uh, I had all amateurs and I had dyke, a dyke ballet with 30 lesbians who'd never been on stage before doing a, the ballet. I had a big drag queen doing the Sugar Plum Fairy and they made their own costumes. And like the first time 250 people came and by the next four years it was the biggest, second biggest thing other than pride. And I realized that's why I write plays is for my community. Like I was putting on people on stage who had never been on stage. We were giving the money to a AIDS hospice. We, it was a, there was a connectedness that's so deep. Then I moved, after years, went to San Francisco and now New York. New York, there's a sense that it, you pull from the, away from the community. Like I'm supposed to write an object that you think is good and want to pay for. And that's not theater to me. 
It's an element of it. We have to make it pay. You have to pay for it. But the heart of it is that we will talk. We will talk. Not me talk or you complain. Ah. You, know? <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> People. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, playwrights, we say the wrong thing, eh? Yeah. Like, we just, well, we tell the truth <laughs> by mistake sometimes. Um, <laughs> just came that's out. enough out of me. That's fantastic. <laughs> I think we're all going to feel free to tell the truth, and then you guys can no, too. We'll leave a little room. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Do you want to jump in? I'll, I'll say just very quickly. Um, I think pe people should do more musicals. <laughs> and I think that they should do new musicals, and I think they should do music new musicals which shouldn't have the burden of having to run for 20 years. The, the thing that I think is yes. wrong with yeah. New York theater now is that people, producers want to produce a show like Phantom of the Opera that can stay in that theater for 20 years and that everyone will hear of, no matter where on the planet they are, they'll know what it is and they'll come and see it. And I think pretty soon all 20 Broadway theaters are gonna be filled with a show that'll run forever and then there just won't be any room <laughs> for New York musicals. So that's why South Coast Rep, and I, I think the movement is to do musicals all around the country in repertory theaters where people are used to the idea that it doesn't have to be the best musical you ever saw in your life. It can still be interesting. You see it, and you tell your friends about it, and then maybe next year you see something else. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, one of the exciting things happening in theater, <clears throat> unlike Washington, is that uh, people of color and women and uh, people who don't identify uh, in a binary fashion uh, are being represented on the stages across the country. I would like to see more people of color and more of those people running the American theaters because um, we shouldn't be at the mercy of one uh, uh, understanding of what experience is and even for those of us who like myself who've been a beneficiary of it, I don't think it's particularly healthy. Mm. Um, musicals that have been revived successfully on Broadway many, many times should not be taking up the stages of not-for-profit theaters. It, I don't mind a revival of Anything Goes <laughs> somewhere in the regions, but I hate to see our major stages uh, filled up with work that commercial producers can do just as well, and um, these writers need to be on the major stages. Um, Anna's play needs to be at the Seegerstrom. That has to happen. And um, make a call. <laughs> I also really feel that what happens when you age in the American theater is that you're either an icon or nothing. And there are some great American playwrights who are not produced anymore because the New York drama critics didn't like them. My mentors, including Maria Irene Fornes, were never produced at many not-for-profit theaters, and I think that's shameful mm. and bad. And they should be seen. Neil Bell is still alive. He should be produced. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I, I feel like everything really like quite worthy ha, has been said, so I don't know if I can add much to the conversation, but uh, a word that comes up a lot for me that feels like very far off, and, but it, it's what I, I feel like we should all be going towards is, is just a meritocracy. And it, it happens, it, it, it doesn't happen often in theater. There's a lot of politics, why things get produced and why other things don't get produced and well this person did three plays for us in the last five years so we're going to give them their other play and the reason the word meritocracy feels impossible and um, is complicated is because of the things that have been said you know what gives something merit Adam what you were saying about how you know I like things often that are, are messy and and aren't perfect and 
um, raise questions and start a dialogue. And to me, that gives it merit, right? It doesn't have to feel like there's a perfect bow on it for it to say this work is good. And, and it doesn't need to run forever or feel like it should run forever for it to have merit. So it, it requires people having taste, which is tricky. Like, can you run something and have a business sort of mind and also have taste? for the work and the effort that was put in and, and really the worthiness of this being put up in front of an audience. Um, so I don't think it's easy and I don't have the answers to that, but it is the far off goal that, that there will be an element of this deserved to be seen and therefore it was. Well, I wanna echo, um Echo Craig's first thought that I think what we're seeing for me is the most exciting transformation and change in, in, in these new leaders and in seeing women and people of color and people who fit outside the binary taking control of these artistic art institutions. I come from the, uh, I say this and I, I don't know if I'll ever get produced there, but I say I come from the public theater. I mean, that's, that's where I learned to write. I interned there. I had a two-year fellowship there. That's my family. That has always been my support group. And a lot of these new leaders I see have come through the public, and that's not surprising to me. Um, when I think about the public and the public's aesthetic, it's a, it's, I think it's a marriage of, in its ideal form, art, um, entertainment, um, commerce, and politics. And it's that marriage of all those that has always been the most exciting theater for me. Um, I think if I could make a polite request to these new leaders, it would, it would be mm -hmm. um, a plea for empathy. Um, I, think, I think there are enemies um, and they are real. And I think sometimes we need to write about them um, from my perspective. I think sometimes we need to point the finger, um, demonize, get mad and make art that is in protest. But I think in order to build future bridges towards understanding um, that empathy needs to be remain at the center of our storytelling and I think empathy is slightly at risk of being lost I think being lost in the objectification mm -hmm. of the art form mm -hmm. right I think we could lose yeah. lose that and um, it's a very complicated statement as a white male to ask any, you know, any artist to, to, to speak from a place of empathy because sometimes rage is appropriate, sometimes, you know, I, and I'm not going to dictate at all. I think it's just, um, it was my entry point into the theater was, was from a place of, of wanting to understand what the other was to me and that other has shifted throughout my life, but, but that endeavor seems worthy of a career in theater. Um, it's, it, and I, I think it brings sort of humanistic values. And I, and I don't doubt these leaders are gonna do it. I know they're gonna do it. It's not to say they're not doing this. This is just what I would wish for. Yeah. Um, I have total faith in them. I, kn I know some of them, they're amazing, and they're gonna do it. Um, and I would say coupled with that, to be very brief, is um, I have made race the focus of a lot of my work, um, which has proved really tricky and uh, slow going, but I think it's absolutely worth the effort um, for me as a white male to begin to pick apart my privilege and my background and do it in a way that honors um, my working class background. Um, and so my, my request is that class is not left out of the equation I here. Yeah. I, think, I think we absolutely need to prioritize race and our thinking and the way we program. Um, it's a necessity when you look at the world. When we get there, let's start thinking about class and the way that class unites us and the way that our working class has been purposefully, strategically disassembled. I'm a, you know, I come from a union family and anything I have is courtesy of a union. Um, I don't forget that when I sit down to write and I, and I want to see those stories and I don't see that, those stories as much as I wish. Yeah. And so a curiosity that, that eventually goes past what you see into the writer and the person, and I think class being an essential equation here in, in meritocracy, mm -hmm. in countering elitism in the American theater. Yeah. Um, and as a West Coast guy, I, you know, I feel very strongly that like, you know, it's a lot harder 
to come from this, this region and go through New York and end up back here. That's a much longer road than, than, than other roads. Um, uh, <laughs> um, anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's great. So um, that's fantastic. Um, I, we're going to open it up in a moment for uh, questions on any topic from any of you. Um, but I wanted to shout out our, our, our thinkers who aren't at the table right now and who are doing deep, deep, deep work throughout this festival. So we all know Kui, poor yellow rednecks, who was supposed to be here. <laughs> so yay, Kui. <laughs> but also Melissa Ross and Chisa Hutchinson, um, just to sort of put their names out there and shout them out as, you know, amazing, amazing people who have amazing, amazing insights and art at the moment here. And there um, is a, the, the composer. Oh, yes, yeah. and Daniel Dan Massey. Dan Massey. Yeah. Yeah. He's flying back to New York as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. He really rejected us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Left town. Um, so, wonderful. Um, now that we've had a chance to like dream a little bit and think a little bit up here, I'd love to open up the, ta uh, the just for questioning, for questions brief comments, anything you'd like to expand this conversation into. Um, anyone? Yeah. Well, I was just struck by something Kevin just said, which is um, the awareness of class and how that worked up. How do you take that when you have sort of what I consider the theory to be sort of a self-selecting audience right. in that it's not an audience that's particularly broad right. in terms of compared to say other forms of uh, art or entertainment, and people who <laughs> it's like, how do you take that, that goal to, you know, create a class consciousness amongst the audience when the audience is so self-selected? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, I trust these leaders are going to, are, are thinking about this. They just, you just have to. I mean, and there's no point in diversifying your seasons if, if, you know, you are speaking to um, a, you know, a not diverse audience. It just, there's. I, so, so there. I, I think it's going to happen, and and I have no idea how you do it. Uh, I mean, you know, I think as player, most players I know, you see an empty seat at your show drives you crazy. I mean, you're like, just sell that thing for five dollars yes. and grab someone off the street. Let's do yeah. this thing. And yeah. then then you hear a hundred reasons why that's impossible, and then you hear that no, we are trying, and then nothing changes. But so, it but is I have changing. No, but okay, yeah, because I. I love Oscar it. Eustace has made a concerted effort to make every single show at the public theater affordable to everyone. When you do a play in New York, even on Broadway, there are programs to bring all high school students in, and they're the best audience you'll ever play to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Building on that, I th it's, a, it's not a quick fix, but um, take children to the theater. Uh, and it's a, there are a lot of p programs that bring grade school children uh, uh, public funding to bring them in to see the theater, uh, help them to develop the habit early, and then when they get to be adults, they'll see it. Otherwise, kids can grow to be uh, 21 and never see a live show. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll real quick just add to that, because I come from, I just recently moved to LA from Minneapolis, and I worked a lot with this theater called Mixed Blood Theater, and I think that there's a very tested legitimacy to the fact that money is an obstacle. It is a legitimate obstacle <laughs> to going to theater. But then you go from there, and I think you also discover that there is a feeling when you've not been invited to some place for a long time that is probably boring, and you probably <laughs> don't want to go. You know what I mean? Or you're not even a good welcome. theater experience is also a priceless entry point into theater. So like at some, somewhere in the world of taking the financial out of it and having a good experience in the theater that, like, feels like you and feels like you belong there, I think, are two things to strongly pursue, mm -hmm. just to throw that in. We have a, there's, there's also like, I think we forget that there's theaters at every level. There's so much theater done all over the country. There's a, doing it in schools, they're doing it in churches, they're doing it like in their backyards, they're doing it. People, everybody does theater. It's not just white people. Something has stopped other people from getting to be here. So that's just what we have to keep looking at and keep working at and, and figuring out, I think. Uh, anyway, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Not a question, but just a reminder that the question on the live stream is 
So she told Thank us that you. we can't hear us. No. Uh, unless we say it back. <laughs> Who else? So the question is, what can we as audience members do on our side to help you show us more than white Anglo-Saxon stories? <laughs> Bring your friends of color. You know, invite them to the, come with you. Or bring your kids. Or like, there was, it was interesting. There was a, um, there's a bit of a thing going on in Philadelphia right now uh, because the Phil they're going to do one of my plays and the season is white people. I'm gay, so there's some to her, and the other two are women. But there was a, quite a bit of an outcry that there was a signed letter from 19 people that uh, there were no people. But of those signed people, n they went and checked, and none of them had seen the last production by a woman of color. Right. And I would be like, oh, dudes, <laughs> absolutely right. But also, it's your responsibility to go to the show and take 10 people with you. Right. And then we can make the theater we want. If we really want to make a theater, let's make our theater. And I think something that gets hard, I guess this is why I want more of this, is like, you're not passive. An audience isn't passive. An audience is making the show with the people. Like, I had such a blast at my show because the audience was in it and with it and lifting our actors. Our actors went up because they're like, oh, these people love us. We are going to give them a show. <laughs> but we made it. We made it. You didn't just sit there. It's not your job just to sit there and go like that. That's TV and film. Right. <clears throat> <laughs> A, a lot of the people who, who, who complain or write to the theater, not just complain, are people who say, I don't like that bad language and I don't know why I'm seeing that trashy whatever. Um, so if you have a hunger to see working class stories um, or stories about less privileged people, then you have to let the theaters know because otherwise all they hear from are the um, reactionaries. <laughs> Love him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Love him. He's amazing. Yeah. He's He's just amazing. I feel like we're solving everything, you guys. <laughs> Does he ever stick it, right? Oh. Boom. <laughs> so question right there, yeah. I can repeat your question. She said, as a teacher, she knows that a lot of young people don't have any exposure to theater. And then she said, what are we personally doing to make sure they do? So this is a good segue to, for me to talk about. Um, I run a, a concert series in New York called Broadway Playhouse, uh, which is free to New York City school children. And they come in, and they get an hour. And we said, today, we're going to talk about Rodgers and Hammerstein. Here's who they are. Here's a little bit of their background. Here's one song that, that you are going to sing along with us. We're going to teach you. Here's a little bit of one of their musicals. And we try to make it very vivid so that through the rest of their lives, whenever they hear Rodgers and Hammerstein or Gershwin or whoever they've seen, they know who that person is. And so I think little, simple education programs like that to talk about, and you can do it in non-musical theater too, but mm. to, to get the, these great names to the next generation and, and interest them, that's what I do. Trinity Rep I worked at, and they actually, it was actually great because they did a school program. It had a bunch of students that would come in early on with Adrian Hall, and the kids would get bored, and they started throwing things at the stage, right? <laughs> 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 It actually changed their aesthetic because what they did was they were one of the early theaters that broke the wall 
and really worked with the audience, walked mm. through the audience, uh, jumped on. Uh, they, they actually said, oh, we've got to keep these kids interested. We can't just do uh, Shakespeare. They changed how we do Shakespeare. Oh, Trinity Rep great. did because they had to because mm. of the students. Mm. And actually, we should probably think, oh, if we want students, we might need to do more interesting work, you know, we may, or we may have to do more of that, like grab, because kids have a shorter attention span and they're not as well behaved. But that's all right, you know. <laughs> so funny, so true. No, not always. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, for you HowlRound folks out there, um, that was just a comment from the audience about how uh, kids have amazing experience in theater at times and uh, really connect with the material. And I think that's so, so true, and I've seen that happen. And I actually don't think it's a bad thing for us as artists to, and as theaters to have to um, live up to the rigor of entertaining our audience no matter what age they are or where they come from. Do you know what I mean? Like you can get very complacent as a theater maker if you're like, oh, it's most like my dinner party and it's people who are just like me here at my dinner. I think there's something amazingly good for our theater about yeah. having to be responsible for entertaining the 12 year old that's sitting over there. We're gonna, we were that good, we can do it, you yeah, know, we're capable, yeah. yeah. I want to thank you for saying that, but I also want to say that there has been a concerted effort since Ronald Reagan to defund all education and particularly to drive the arts out of education. But it's not stopping those teachers. No, it's not stopping the teachers, but we have to do something about the enemies of the quality of our lives. So that was a shout out to the teachers who are putting on plays across America in spite of obstacles is what that was. Um, yes. Oh, is there a yes? All I know is that kids get themselves to concerts. Yeah. So they're not coming to us. And there's a, I, I know a 
bunch of kids that would have loved to see Queen's show. I mean, because it's amazing. Mm. And just, it's, a, it's a slightly different thing. So, uh, just to repeat what you said, which we're supposed to do, um, that the the kids may love the theater, but they go back to parents who don't know the theater. I think our goal with this. Broadway Playhouse thing is to make it so exciting and fun for them in the hour that they're that they go home and say wow We went to this really cool thing today And I think most parents are still really interested in what their parent their kids have to say and I've had certain uh, It's certain cases where the parent or the teacher said this kid it coming to the theater changed this kid's life They were really interested. We had one little boy who was really a, be a behavioral problem but he came to the first concert and he realized that he wasn't going to get to the second concert unless he behaved a little <laughs> bit better. So honestly, I do think that the parents, if, if you excite them enough, the parents will hear. And a lot of parents will figure, oh, he seemed to like that play. Oh, here's a play. Maybe I'll take them to another play. That's mm -hmm. the hope, at any rate. Yeah. Um, we're running low on time, so one last question. <laughs> Ask for help. I'll give you my yes. email. We'll put you in touch with other people who read new plays. Uh, there's nothing more exciting, rewarding for an artist, a living artist of any age, than to be able to give freely what was given to us yes. freely. So I'll give you my call. So this is, thank you, a great closer. We're getting a nugget of advice for aspiring young playwrights from all our panelists here. I, I think one to piggyback on what Craig said, one thing that's amazing about writers, I, I would say more than, than any other artist that I can think of, is that they actually do support each other. There's a real feeling of, well, I couldn't write that play because you wrote it. As opposed to, you know, I'm also an actor, and actors are like, get out of the way. <laughs> so, um, and ri writers <laughs> really aren't like that. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, the reason that this is so, this is just the most wonderful um, job, and we all feel quite lucky to do it, is because because of the room of people uh, that is, you know, reading your play. And, and this is maybe annoying advice because it's certainly not how to get successful in 20 steps, but you have to have your plays read out loud. You have to have them read out loud often with people that you trust, and you have to have them read out loud for an audience. And that can happen in an apartment. And that, that's how I started writing, and that's, that's what changed my life, was having my plays read in just like really gritty, sad ways and I would provide alcohol and cheese and that gets most people out of bed. Um, and that's gonna, the first thing is that's gonna have people hear your stuff. It's also gonna give you the emotional catharsis which is really how you, like that's the carrot, that's like the dragon you're chasing. Um, and it's also gonna make you a better writer because if you don't know how your words sound coming out of an actor's mouth then you have really no idea if, if the play flies. So. Yeah. We're pretty much at time, so can I get Sorry. one word? No, no, no. No, you're fine. <laughs> one word from the rest of you? Yeah, I know, I know. Sorry for existing. Yeah. <laughs> just say do. Did it, just say do. My, my word is do it yourself. Do, do, do not be passive. Do not wait for a, a theater to pick you and, and get a first class production. Get your friends, like you said, mm -hmm. like he did with the drag show. Put it on yourself. It doesn't have to be professional. Uh, initiate the work yourself, and then people will see it and, and they'll join you. Ditto. Ditto. I just want to say thank you. I love coming here because you actually come and attend and listen. Yeah. And in New York, everyone has 10,000 things to not see every <laughs> night. And I feel so grateful every time yeah. I'm here because of the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Thank you for that conversation. Enjoy the rest of the day.
I know. <laughs> no, it's good. It's you were. It's only no. 10? Wait, wait, yeah, I have to go to bed now? I, I have a show at 2.30. I have so many hours. I know, I know. It's so early. Well, you go and see the reading, but then we have a little bit of time after, right? I get, wait, is wait, there a reading now? Yeah, I have another reading. Yeah, well, so, the yeah. panel. I know. Yeah. What a panel. That's so fun. Eh? So fun. Lucas is so good. Oh, you guys are great. So good to meet you. Thank you.